ready? Does everybody have their, their Bibles? Your swords, your notes, your paper? One of the things I've learned early on when there's a guest speaker, somebody speaking or giving you information, it's always good to write it down. Remember, whatever gets written down comes to pass. And you say, well, I'll never look at my notes or this or that. But let me tell you something. When you write it down, it comes to pass. That's why you write things down and you put it on your fridge. Let's say you want to lose weight or get debt free. You write it down and you put it up to see it and believe it. Because whatever you speak comes towards you. That's why in the culture, it's fear and death, sensuality and sin. Because that's what the enemy wants to bring to you. So that's what they present. What you speak comes towards you. So we're going to look in the book of Haggai. We're going to speak Haggai because something good is coming towards you. Something good is coming towards me and this church and my family. Whatever you hear, you repeat. Even if, even if you don't mean to. Whatever you hear, you repeat. Whatever you speak comes towards you. Whatever you write down comes to pass. That's why who wrote the Torah? God. Stone tablets. It's going to come to pass. Father, I thank you for allowing me to share through total inspiration of you this message. Father, I'm not worthy to share this. But you chose me. So I want to be an obedient son. And I want to share this word, Father. Father. Because it is a good word, Father, for your children. And you are not the God of confusion and chaos. You are a God of order. And I thank you, Father, for the strategy that you're giving us to live out in the days in which we live. It's a great opportunity, Father. I bind the enemy, Father. I pray that this word will come to fruition a hundredfold. Forgive us for fooling around, for lollygagging, for not having quick obedience. We pray for quick obedience, Father. We we. Pray for a right action from this word today, Father. For today is the day of salvation. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. I've always been a firm believer in understanding why do you do what you do? Some of it we can attribute it to bad habits. But when it comes to spiritual things or a church, it's okay to ask the question, why do you guys do that? Why do you do this? How many of you understand what I'm saying? Because you can't just say, you know, be quiet and do it. You really need to explain why we do what we do because it's, it also involves customs and traditions. Now, I share this because it's important that you understand this part anyway. And I'm a firm believer in this. In Proverbs 4, 7, it says, Proverbs 4, 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. So what I've discovered in the 20 years of me being in the Hebrews of the Christian faith, this congregation literally being over 20 years of age and birthed by the Father through the Dreyer family, we need to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Where is this taking us? What's the point? You know, and, and as a full-time minister or clergy, it's my responsibility to give you the best message that I can give you from the Lord, the best encouragement and the best instructions. Some of you are stay-at-home mothers, and, and you're with kids all day long, and you're working hard, and some of you have full-time jobs, and sometimes you even got to work on the weekends, and so much is going on. But it's my responsibility to, to allow you to come in here and to receive a word from the Lord and begin to do it in the circumstance in which you are living or where you're at. And I'm telling you, God waits for no man. And that, that's the word that he's kind of given me. God waits for no man. He is moving. And the cloud is moving. And so we need to, to catch up to Yahweh because he's moving. God waits for no man. And, and I'm, I'm only sharing this because, like I said, I've, I've been a, a pastor here over 13 years. And I've seen a lot. But now it's getting really, really good. I'm beginning to see things that I've been waiting for. 
I'm beginning to understand now why he set Beit El up the way that he did. I understand the principles and the, and, 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 and the procedures and how he's operating now and what he's asking of us to do, amen? Because see, at the end of the day, you know, did I do what the Lord told me to do? And that's all he's asking. He's not asking for supernatural things. He's not asking for me to do things that I can't do. He's simply asking me to do what he's asked me to do. And, and sometimes there are disappointments and, and everything like that. But I believe that something incredible happened this Hanukkah season. I think there was a breakthrough. I think something was released in the earth. And, and, and I, and I want to share this message with you because I'm starting to understand better the spiritual laws and the cosmic chess match that is happening in the heavenlies, good versus evil. You know, Satan moves a piece, God moves a piece. But how many know the devil's checkmate? Jesus made it very clear, the ruler of this world has been judged. He's just a bully. Isn't that funny how we don't want to be a bully? The whole thing's about don't be a bully in the schools and everything, right? Well, Satan's a bully, but he's been exposed. So we're going to unlock Hanukkah. We're going to unlock why we're drawn to Hanukkah. What was so special about it? Why is it growing? Why am I sharing it with my pastor friends, the Hanukkah story? What is going on here? Lord, what are you doing? It's a movement, see? And today, like I said, we're going to unlock the book of Haggai. Are you ready for 38 verses today? Can you handle two chapters of the Bible today? Okay, three of you can. We're going to go over the book of Haggai, not in depth, but I want to unlock to you and show you what was shown to me. And like I said, this this is fresh, this is new. I've never taught on this, but how many of you know we got false prophets out there? But if we go to the written prophets, if we go to Haggai, we'll be safe. Because that word is tried and true. And see, that's the problem, everybody. Everybody's running around wanting a word, and there's those that will give you that word, but it ain't this word. When I say, Lord, I need a word from you, he said, okay, Isaiah 40 to 66. (laughs) That was a big word. He didn't give me some crazy statement or off-the-wall stuff to do. So we're going to go into the book of Haggai, And we're going to look at this book, and it, of course, was written around 520 B.C., so we know that there's a a kingdom shift from the Babylonian captivity, Babylonian empire, to the Persians, and how many know that through the Persian king Darius, uh, a statement was written or put out by the king that the people could go back and rebuild. The people could go back and build their temple and go back to their homeland. How many understand what I'm saying? See, what's happening in the earth today, you must understand this, everybody, that that the Hebrews of the Christian faith is the move of God. But what's happened to it? It's been hijacked. It's been misinterpreted. It's been misrepresented. It's brought on Judaism. So here at Beit Hila, we are going to properly interpret the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith the way that God intended it. We're going to properly interpret it through the Holy Spirit and His Word. So in Haggai... It's very interesting. We're going we're gonna to begin with Haggai 1.1. Once again, if you could pay attention with me, you can sleep later. We're going to have the public reading of Scriptures. How many of you love my format, the public reading of Scriptures? Yeah. Amen. And you can see that. Okay, so we're going to read this together, and we're going to go over. Here we go. Haggai 1.1, fasten your seatbelts. I'm going to boldly take you where no messianic has ever gone before. And if you heard this message in the way that I'm presenting it, please stop me, because I don't want to bore you. Here we go. Are you ready? In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, stop right there, just stop right there. When did the word of the Lord come? Elul 1, right down in the sixth month on the first day. Teshuvah. Now, how many of you have had the privilege of doing the season of Teshuvah with us? Raise your hand. Wow, see, there's nothing new under the sun because this is 520 B.C. So the word of the Lord comes on the first day of Teshuvah. And what do we do on Teshuvah? Because we've done it two years in a row. What do we do at the beginning of Teshuvah? Daniel fast. Nothing's an accident. 
Nothing's an accident. This happens on Elul 1 Teshiva. The Lord is going to give a correction. He's going to bring something to light. He's going to bring a correction. So Elul 1 begins the season of Teshiva, and it ends on Tishri 10, which is the Day of Atonement. So this is the beginning of a season that's, that's happening in 520 B.C. How many of you understand what I'm saying? See, we're no longer in captivity. We're no longer, okay, in captivity. We're in the despoir. We're scattered, but the captivity's over, baby. We are back. We are back, and we are here. And that's the beauty of God. So the only thing holding you back from all that he has for you is yourself. So I want all that he has for me, and I'm going to get out of the way. Let's read Haggai 1-2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Elul 1 Teshuvah. So the Lord's bringing correction, and he's correcting the people. The people are saying, Oh, forget God's house. We're going to build our house. This is me, 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 my life, my way, my beautiful house. Look at my addition. Well, where do you expect me to put my mother-in-law? Look at my addition here. Build your houses and all this stuff. So he's bringing a correction like what? You got your priorities mixed up. Your priorities are out of order. And I, I'm telling you right now, there's people in here, your priorities are out of order. And you can get mad at me. You can get upset with me all you want. Take it to the Lord. Because if you wonder why you're in the mess that you're in, it's because your house is out of order. People wonder how Danielle and I do it with seven kids. And people say, oh, I could never do that. I could well, we can. Why? Because we serve a God of order. It's called organized chaos. <laughs> if we can function and properly function and do the things that we're accomplishing, what's your excuse? There are none. There are none. So the priorities are not in order. He's saying, what about my house, right? I'm going to continue to read some verses, and then we're going to go back to the public reading of scriptures because I don't want this to escape you. I'm going to be reading Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, continuing on. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your paneled houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Look at Haggai 1.6. Let's read it together. Ye have so much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Ye reap what you sow. Notice the word lacking. Don't raise your hand, but are some of you lacking in here? What did Paul say? I'm content, right, in much or in little. He talks about that, right? None of you should be lacking. If you're where you need to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, I'm telling you right now, you will have no lack. So we have to ask ourselves, I have to ask myself, why am I lacking? Because I dropped the ball, or maybe I was misguided, or maybe I got to change my attitude, maybe I got to change my perception. Because we're overcomers. Do you know what Israel means? Prevailing prince, co ruler with God. Well, gee, no wonder nobody wants to be grafted into that tree because that's just too much work. You mean i got to be obedient? Absolutely. You're in the commonwealth of Israel. You serve a king. You're his subjects. We prove ourselves today, everybody. I'm proving myself right now. I prove myself when I leave here to the Lord. I prove to him that I want to rule and reign with him now. Not sit on my blessed assurance. Something's got to be done, and and I can't get somebody to do it. I'm doing it. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to say, who cares? I'm going to do it. Why? Because you're going to prove yourself today for your future tomorrow. Think about it. So he's given a a diagnosis. It's not good, is it? You have sown much and bring in little. That sounds sad. But I've worked so hard. I work hard. Your life's out of order. Priorities are out of order. Let's look at, well, uh, let me read Haggai 1.7. Here it is. He says it again. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
Now, when I'm ministering to you, God's already taken me behind the woodshed. So this is nothing new for you, right? He's already taken me out back, right? Because I keep putting off the budget for the plumber family. Oh, I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. December rolls around, January. I'll do it in the new year, biblical new year, Gregorian new year, the tree new year, the king new year. And guess what? The Lord's like, it's over for you, buddy. You will have a budget for your family as of January 1st. I'm like, and so I really fear the Lord. It's like, that's like the real deal. Consider your ways. So I just told on myself, didn't I? I just told on myself. What? Pastor doesn't have a budget? Oh, we don't either. So all I'm saying is that whatever he's telling me to do, I'm considering my ways. Consider your ways. Consider your ways, not your wife's ways, not the kids' ways, not the church's ways. Consider your ways. It's personal. Look, look at verse 8, Haggai 1.8. Here we go. Let's read it. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. We built this house so God could be glorified. Isn't this a beautiful place? There's nothing like this place. This is like a big living room for God. I wish everyone could have a recliner. But you have to keep the remote controls at the door. But to me, it's like a big living room with God. It's, it's warm, it's cozy, it's fun. It's like a big living room. And that's how I want God to be with us. The father in the living room, just with his kids on his lap. Look at this, it's a priority. Is the house of God a priority? I actually had somebody, it was kind of interesting. We were over at the... Uh, I say the fellowship hall now, the modular, and we had our plans all up in there. And this woman comes up and she says, how could, you, how could you want to collect money for this and build this when people are losing their houses? And there's a you know, mortgage crash. And how could, how could you give this to the people when people are losing their homes in a mortgage crisis? I said, I don't care what you say. I said, you build God's house, you'll have a house. She's just like, whoa, whoa. This is how we think, though. Poverty mentality. You know, have you ever seen it? I see it in my house. Something comes out of the oven, like a pie or cookies, right? And all the cookies are gone, and a child comes up, there's no more cookies. We'll make some more. God has provided. We just need to put them in the oven and make them. But that's our mentality. It's this all the pies gone mentality. When God is so big that he has everything. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills and all the potatoes in the hills. He, he doesn't lack. We have this poverty mentality, digging through the couch cushions for change. Then you find all the stuff you lost, like earrings and things. Poverty mentality. We've got to be broken of that. When you're obedient, God will take care of you. He will bless you. I don't believe in name it and claim it. I believe obedience gives you riches. He even says, I'll provide you the means to gain wealth. Some of you want to go into business for yourself. I would encourage you to. Poverty mentality. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. And that's what we want here. He takes pleasure in this place because he gave it to us. He gave us favor with the bank, and we had the finances and everything. Why? Because, because why? He's going to be glorified in here. We don't do bingo in here. We don't have rollerblading, okay? We don't do circus acts and, and all that other stuff, okay? This is God's sanctuary, it's a holy place. Continuing on in Haggai 1, 9, and 10. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So when there's drought, that means God's withholding the blessing. It's a natural law. But we receive rain, don't we? If, if we didn't have rain, we better be praying and pressing in. So once again, priority. Listen, I'm preaching to myself today. Some of my priorities are out of line, and God's given me an adjustment. How many of you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sharing this message. You just happen to be in the room. Really, my family should be up here, maybe in some leadership. But all of you get to hear this too because we all need it. I need it. I want to be better. I want to do better. Why? Because when I do better, you do better. That's how it works. 
Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I need to constantly be asking myself, how can I be more spiritual? How can I do better exercises of praying and worshiping, reading my Bible? And then I can worry about the electric bill. How come I'm not praying? How come I'm not worshiping? How come I'm not having good attendance at church? How come church is like a theme park instead of a way of life? So you take your way of life and you come in here with my way of life and your way of life and we make this place rock for God. That's why when you celebrate the Sabbath on Friday night as a family or as individuals or a group or whatever, whether you're single or married or not married, and you bring that anointing in here. And that's what we feel. But if we all were just running around on Friday night and we'd come in here, it'd be a mess. We've already positioned it. We've already prepared ourselves. We've already greased the skids. We're ready to go. We honored it last night. Now we're going to come in here and some of you are uncomfortable because you didn't do good on Sabbath. Maybe you were someplace you shouldn't be or doing things you shouldn't be doing. And you come in here and you're uncomfortable. Why? Because you didn't bring that anointing. You brought in something that's familiar or an unclean spirit. I'm just telling you the way it is. We need the Sabbath right now, the times in which we live. We need Sabbath. We need to slow down and stop and get cleaned up and, and let that week just get off of us. So we can come in here and, and, and do war. Haggai 111, let's read it. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. He called for a drought. Why? Because the priorities were out of line. He's trying to get their attention through weather patterns. And we can see this in the prophets in more than one occasion. God does these weather patterns to try to get their attention. And they still continue to sin and not get it. And we can see this. Notice I put circumstances. Are some of you experiencing a drought right now? That's not God's best. That's not what he wants for you. He doesn't want you to stay in the wilderness. He doesn't want you to be in a drought. He wants you to come out of it. Come to your senses like the prodigal son and daughter. Come out of your senses and confess to him your wrongs. I've learned this while I haven't gotten over this sin. You keep confessing it until you get the victory. You keep confessing it until you're totally delivered. You don't go into denial and try to cover it up. I've learned this with the Lord. I've learned this with leadership. When I drop the ball and I mess up, I say, I messed up. I messed up. I got into a little fender bender. And if some of you see my car, I need to put a little Band-Aid on it. But I got into a little fender bender because I creeped up on somebody and, and I was looking down and getting my phone out. It fell on the uh, floorboard and, the, and then the traffic was moving and then it started slowing down. And when I reached down, Josiah was even with me and I went up underneath this like Jeep and the, 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 my car really took the, the blunt of it and their car's fine because I went up underneath it like and it just smashed in the grill and the headlight and that's really all that happened. And I get out of the car and I start talking to the lady. I said, you want to call the police? And so we exchange information and everything like that. And, 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 uh, and I literally, I asked her, says, you know, will you please forgive me for that? Because I was not paying attention and I ran into the back of you. And, will you please forgive me? She just kind of looked at me. You know, I said, I am so sorry. You know, I said, I was at fault. It was my fault. So we exchanged information and everything. But it was funny how I had a, I had a choice to make. I could have just blown it off and done whatever. But I realized that I was wrong. And I immediately recognized it. And ask for forgiveness. And how many of you know that when you give a church card to somebody in a car accident, you might want to be a little humble? <laughs> oh, my gosh, this is the pastor. Oh, yeah, I was very ashamed. And, my, and Josiah wouldn't even look at me. I can't believe you, Dad. I am so embarrassed. He just turned the other way, you know. I can't believe you. I don't even think he wants to ride with me anymore. But things happen. Accidents happen. Things happen. You never know what's going to happen to you. I, I still can't believe I did it. And I got a safe driver on my license still. For how long, I don't know. So we don't want a drought in our life. I don't want you to have a drought. All the blessings that come to Beit Tehillah will be given out to all of you. Just like this building or anything we do here, the blessings that we get will be transferred to the people. How I many you understand what I'm saying? But let's look at Haggai 112. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Does everybody see that? 
That is awesome. Notice the word remnant underlined. Notice obeyed. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell all of you right now, and, and I've always wondered about this, but I know that I know that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. At this point in time, everything the Father is showing me, we are the remnant. Look it up in the Bible. Look up the word remnant all throughout the Bible, and I'm telling you right now, we are a remnant. We're not here to convert everybody. We're not here to say we're right and the church is wrong. We're not here to come against any minister or ministry. Mark my words. We are here to do righteousness. We are here to do what God has called us to do. And we have broken away from the pack, and that's who we are, period. And if you want to persecute us in our obedience, then so be it. Bring it on, baby, because we're ready for you. Because we fear God and no man. The church is the church. The church is going to keep doing what it's doing. Pharisees and Sadducees continue to do what they do. The Pope's going to do what he does because that's all he knows to do. And there'll be another Pope and another Pope. Who cares? But what are we going to do? We're going to do what God is showing us to do because we love our Father and we fear him and we love him so much that we want to do this even if we're persecuted. We'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake, not because of gossip or slander. I love the church. I love the Pope and the Cardinals and the Catholics. You hear me out. I love the Muslims. I love Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses. I love them all. But God's calling me to obedience. He's separating me out of the pack. And I love it. And I'm thriving on it. And it's a pleasure to be his servant and to be his witness. I'm not here to debate. I'm not here to argue. I'm not. I don't have time for that. I'm 48 years old. I got seven kids in this church. I'm telling you about it. This is an opportunity. I still can't believe. I'm dreaming. It's like a dream. And you want me to lead this, Lord? Really? I'll do the best I can. We're so caught up in social media in a selfish life that this looks foreign to you up here. Because the Bible's foreign to those that are sucked into social media. Because you're so worried about your reputation and how many contacts you have and your friends, you need the friend of Jesus. He's the only one you need. He's not going to unfriend you. But this is what I'm saying. I'm not against social media. I'm telling you right now, you'll lose your soul. You'll lose your soul on Facebook. Yeah, because your face is in a book, not in the face of God. You think it's good, but it's not. Because if you don't know how to use social media, it will suck your soul out of your body, and you'll be decimated because of social media. You'll be destroyed because you said something wrong, did something wrong, and you will be destroyed from those that you thought were your friends. And that's a path you should have never taken. I'm warning you. I'm not losing my soul. We use social media for the glory of God and to promote bait to heal and what we're trying to do. We're not here to put people down, call people out, have an opinion about what's going on in the world. Amen. Amen? Donald Trump can take care of himself. And if you don't like Donald Trump, it's too bad because he represents America. Oh, if you don't think that's bad enough, Hillary Clinton, she represents America. I don't believe that. The Christians should. We are a minority, people. Born-again people are a minority. We're a minority. We're not going to elect the next president. Do I believe in voting? Do I believe in America? Yes, I'm an American citizen. Just like Paul was a Roman citizen, he used it to his advantage. When they were beating him, you can't do this. I'm a Roman citizen. He knew to pull out the citizenship card and the visa and the passport and everything. And we live in the second greatest country in the world. Do you want the truth? Do you want me to tell you the truth? Or do you want me to wait and just sprinkle it? Just sprinkle a little truth to you. Listen, I'm still, I still can't comprehend all this. I'm like, you really want me to share this, Lord? I just got it. No, tell them now. Don't wait. You don't eat old manna, folks. I told my pastor friends, that's old glory. We talk about old glory in the conference. That's old glory. We need new glory. We need the new glory of God in here. New glory. His glory. New glory. When I was 17, I remember that glory of God came down. Oh, oh. I don't care. You ain't 17 no more. You're 80. Where's the glory of God? I don't know. I don't know. Who is that? Seriously, people, I'm not living in the past. Because when his glory comes in here, you will not stand. You won't be able to stand. You're going to go into a fetal position. 
But the only way you can get the glory of God is if you expose yourself. Oh, I want signs, miracles, and wonders. No, that's because you're selfish. You seek after a sign. But those that want the glory say, Lord, I'm naked before you. As soon as you get to that place, he will show up in his glory. And my wife gets on me all the time. You share too much about our family. And I'm transparent. Why? Because I want his glory. I don't want to be up there on the stage. I want to be down here on the carpet with you guys. I want to be transparent. Why? Because then I'm going to get his glory. Well, pastor's real, honey. I think you might want to be. Right? Be real. Be who you are. Be who God created you to be. Paul is Paul. I don't want him to be nothing else. Don't be Canadian. Please don't be Canadian. I mean, we try to be something we're not. Don't. And the Hebrews of the Christian faith is dangerous because you can do all these things and become something else other than what God intended you to be. If I do this and if I do that, if I wear this and I wear that, it'll change me. It'll make me, I'll be accepted. No, you need to come as Diana Linda Kugel. Hi, I'm Diana Linda Kugel. There's only one of me. That's right, only one. Alice has got to be Alice. Be yourself when you come in here. Be yourself. This is good stuff. Look at this. This is interesting. I'm going to read Haggai 1.13. Keep it there. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. He's with us. Let's go to verse 14. Haggai 1.14. Let's read it. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. It was only the, the monarchy, it was, it was Zerubbabel, he's from, the, he's from the line of Judah, here's the high priest, and a remnant, and the spirit of the Lord came upon them. See, all I've got to do in here is build a core group i got to build this core group of people that are sold out. we got to grow the core group out. That's what we have to do here. We're going for the holy of holies, amen? So think about this. They came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. This word remnant, it means a remainder or residual. Listen to this. Surviving final. It means a portion that had escaped. See, I escaped the world. I escaped the religious system. I, I, I escaped church politics. I escaped the messianic mafia. I escaped it. Why? Because God wanted me for himself. He didn't want me to be deluded in all that garbage. He says, I'm going to bring you to where you need to be. People ask me all the time, have you been to Bible college? Have you been to seminary? Have you done this? Have you done that? I, I received the vision from a family that handed it to me that was already in me, and it was activated. And this thing's bigger than me. And it's priceless. You couldn't write me a check right now. Pastor Nick, I'm going to give you $10 million. A billionaire. Maybe he hears my message or something and wants to buy me out. I'm going to give you $10 million. Just walk away. Take that money and go do something. Maybe go to Sister Connor. Dude, just go walk away. You don't need to do all this. Just walk away. You couldn't, you couldn't pay me. You couldn't pay me for this. There's no way you can pay me for this. It's priceless. Why? Because what I'm doing is forever. What I'm doing is forever. God created me for the restoration and the regathering of the whole house of Israel. I'm sold out now. I tell my pastor friends, you better wake up. You're grafted in. It's time to go to work. And with grafting in comes the right action. You can't sit on your blessed assurance. You know, it's like the fireman. You know, here's the fireman, you know. There's a fire, there's a fire. I'm a fireman. Give me another iced tea. I'm a fireman. You ain't doing jack. You ain't doing nothing. You say you're Israel, show me. Prove to me. You better be having a right action. And that's what people do outside the community. They got the language but they don't have the covenant. How many people sitting at home, Shabbat Shalom, Hanukkah, all this stuff, sitting on their blessed assurance when they could be a part of a, a move of God right now? 
I could pack a stadium for all the people that came in and out of Beit Tehillah. Why? It's a remnant. It's a remnant. He said it's a remnant. A remnant. Posterity to be left, a remainder. Haggai 115. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king, what day is this? Elul 24. I want you to see the response of the people, and we better have the same response. The word of the Lord came on Elul 1. It took them 24 days to respond to do the work, but they're still in Teshuvah. Do you get that? The people responded 24 days later to the correction of the Lord. This is good stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's so good. You ain't seen nothing yet. That's the first chapter. We all did the book of Haggai, the first chapter. Give yourself a hand. Okay, you haven't graduated yet. Are there some people that would like the second chapter? Can we go on? Okay, two of you. Here we go. So once again, you're still in the season of Elul, Teshuvah, first day correction. They correct themselves. They, they get it. And now we're going to move on. Ooh, Haggai 2.1. Here we go. Let's read it. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, do you see this? Let's go over chronological order now. Elul 1, correction is given to the people from the Lord. Elul 24, they respond. They're moving towards the feast days. All of a sudden, the word of the Lord comes again. A third time, you see this coming, this chronological timeline. Please stay with me. This is the last day of tabernacles. The seventh day of tabernacles. Are the feast day important? If you don't celebrate the seasons of the feast days, you're going to be lost because there's nothing new under the sun. I'm going to read two and three. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So Solomon's temple was glorious and grand. How many of you saw that? And then, of course, some people saw that temple, didn't they? So now the father is getting ready to bust out with the dream, the dream temple. First the natural, then the spiritual. Let's read Haggai 2, 4. Let's read it. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. How many of you know building a strong community and raising the next generation is a lot of work? I mean, come on, how many diapers is that? We can't count. To come and, and encourage people, is, isn't that work? I mean, it is work. It's effort. How many of you understand what I'm saying? To build relationships is work. Calling somebody's work. Tom calls all the men the day before the men's meeting. Thank you, Tom. That is work. He comes home, he gets, you know, does a few things, he gets on the phone, and he calls all the men. And by the way, the last men's meeting, we had over 50. And it was busting out, man. I'm telling you, man, that, that fellowship hall was like this. I had to get everybody over to the middle. But all I'm saying is that it's growing because the men are sharpening men. And the little men are like one-third of the, the place there, you know. My, kid, my, my boys are starting to jockey for what's for dinner. I want to pick it. And there, could, there could be a coup. <laughs> so now all of a sudden, this is going on. And what day is it? The last day of tabernacles. Does everybody see that? In 2.5 it says, According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. So God's always with us. He's always with you. He wanted to remind them that my spirit was with you when I brought you out of Egypt. My spirit will be with you when you rebuild. See, God, God tears down. There's a time to tear down. There's a time to build up. And I'm telling you right now, you are living in the best times of the plan of God. It is time to be restored and regathered. Hang, ar hang around those that are positive and uplifting and encouraging. Don't hang around those that are tearing down and, and judgmental. Get away from them. Say, get thee behind me, <laughs> you judgmental person. 
It's no time to be judgmental. Casting down vain imaginations, taking captive every thought. We can't tear down. My pastor friends, I build up. I love. I'm building them up. We're building each other up. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus says, oh, they'll know you're my disciples because of the Torah that's in you, right? No, no. Because of your righteousness. No, because of the love you have for one another. So here's the interesting thing. If this message now is getting ready to come forth about a future temple, it's on the last day of tabernacles. The day of the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day. How many of you understand that? Now, supposedly, 5,776 years ago, God created the earth and Adam and Eve and all that stuff. And I'm not into dates, but I will submit this, though. I believe that we're approaching the 6,000-year mark. Why? Because Jesus has to rule and reign for what? A thousand years. So he's given you the answers way in advance. Now we're going to go into a prophecy. So on the last day of tabernacles, after the people heard the word of the Lord, on a little one, they responded 24 days later and started doing something. God says, I'm going to show you Mo. You know Mo? Welcome to Mo's. I'm like, thanks for having me. Now he's going to say, okay, what you're doing is great, but you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to show you my glorious temple, and we're going to read Haggai 2.6. Here's the prophecy. Let's read it. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I mean, that's what he said. I'm going to shake, I'm going to shake it. Keep reading. 2.7. And I will shake all nations... And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. See, there's coming a day where the temple will be built, and everybody will go up to it. This is good stuff. This is just a practice run in here today. This is just a dry run. This is a rehearsal. So think about it. If you don't want to come in here, you're not going to that temple. Because you can't even do this one. If you can't do Beit Tehillah, baby, you can't do what's coming. The spiral, we're going higher. Look at, look at Haggai 2.8. What about finances? The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. It's funny, everything's about finances and the cost of fossil fuel and the barrel of oil and all these other things. He's like, hey, it's all mine. So who's really controlling the market? God is. Keep, keep reading this prophecy, 2.9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So how many of you know that in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, is Ezekiel's temple? How many of you know if you study that temple, it's never been built, never been produced? How many understand what I'm saying? It's never been done, never been produced, never been built. So it's future. How about in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem coming down? Right? How about the new heavens and new earth after the thousand reign of Christ? How many of you understand what I'm saying? Now listen, you need to understand the seasons, the dates, and the times, and what God is doing that in hindsight we can understand better looking back to see the future. So he's saying on the seventh day of tabernacle, I'm going to show you my temple. Why? Because Jesus is going to rule and reign from the year 6,000 to 7,000. Because after the 7,000 comes a new heaven and a new earth. Come on now. Some of you are still living in your little playhouse. He's telling you what he's going to do in advance. And we don't even think about that. People are in an uproar. And how many of you know there's controversy over the temple today? Who's going to build a temple? What kind of temple? Who's going to build it? Is the temple mount even the temple mount? I mean, who cares? God's going to do it. He's got a big temple coming. But we're the temple of God. So think about God wanting to build lively stones together. He wants you and I to come together to build something for him. And somebody said to me, well, I'm not going to really be, if I wasn't here, I wouldn't really be missed. I don't matter. I said, are you kidding me? Of course you would. Let me give you an example. What if we're all in here and all of a sudden you see like, like a brick wall and you see like three bricks missing and the sunlight is coming in? Would you notice that? That's you. 
Everyone is significant. Everybody matters. Quit listening to the lies of the enemy. You know how many voices I hear saying, you're not good enough? You know how many times he brings up my past? All the time. And I say, I rebuke you, Satan. God is qualifying me. He's calling me. I don't listen to you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I am weak, he is strong. If he brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. This is good stuff. So we know there's a future temple coming. Let's continue in Haggai 2.10. You guys are doing so good. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Oh, I'm going to go back over this, because I've, I've read this so many times now. I want to go back over it, because I don't want to lose anybody. And you do have your hand out. We'll go over that last. On Elul 1, the word of the Lord comes to say, hey, your priorities are out of order. Build my house. There was a correction that needed to be made. How many understand what I'm saying? On Elul 24, the people respond to the word of the Lord, and they change their life. They realize, let's build God's house. Let's get to work. Does everybody understand that? So when they respond to that, then the word of the Lord comes on the last day of tabernacles, and he says, hey, everybody, this is my temple. The, this is going to be so great. What you're doing, it's okay, but let me show you what I'm going to build. And isn't it isn't interesting that Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. How many of you that his place is better than your place? Amen. Amen. Especially if I'm building something, anything he does is better than what I'm doing. I'm going to prepare a place for you, a position for you, a position. And it's all about Jesus. That's Haggai 2.10. Kislev 24, the day before Hanukkah, the word of the Lord comes in 520 B.C. You've got to understand this to understand why we're doing what we're doing, where we're heading. I'll keep reading. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. So the correction comes the people make the correction. And then he says, I want to show you my greater house. And then he says, oh, and by the way, let me show you this. This is the evening before Hanukkah. In the ninth month of the month of Kislev on 24, Haggai 2.14. Let's read it. Here we go. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. We're all unclean. So to compare and contrast, you're better off than she is. I'm better off than he is. I'm better off than who, who he is. And, and you might as well forget all that. We're all unclean. We've all got problems. We've all got sins. Do you see, do you see the prophet? The Lord is telling us, hey, we're all unclean. We're all a mess. There's something in your life you've got to work on, I'm sure. If you're not sure, ask your wife. Listen to this. I'm going to read. I'm going to read 15 to 17. And now I pray you consider from this day and upward from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. Once again, lacking. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands, yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. See, there are people right now that need to be here. This verse 17 is happening to them, and they still don't realize that they need to be in church. Did you know that we are commanded to come together on the Sabbath? This is not, I'm not a control freak. I'm doing this for your own good. I'm here, it's for my own good. My kids are here, it's for their own good. My wife's here, it's for her own good. My family is here because of the plumber's family's own good. The shepherd needs the sheep. The sheep should need the shepherd. 
Did you know that reciprocation happens? Did you know that? That I need you and you need me? Do you understand that concept at all? I mean, you're in the same pasture, supposedly. So why should this shepherd go running out of the pasture to go grab something that's not his? And then you've wasted time and you've got the sheep here that you need to love and take care of. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you, God ain't playing around. This is interesting. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands, yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. I'm hearing all these stories of people outside Beit Tehillah that are having just as miserable. And they, don't, they can't come to their senses that they need the body of Christ. Service is too long. My kids can't sit still. It's to your loss. Are you kidding me? There's no excuses. How many kids do I have sitting with me? Oh, that's different, Pastor Nick. You got help. No, I don't. Matter of fact, where are my kids right now? Are they, I mean, I don't even know. Lord, be with them. There's one. Is there even a baby in that thing? No, okay. Well, I'm, down, well, I'm down to a daughter and a son out of seven. Oh, wait. Oh, hey, how you doing? Whew, good, one's on camera. But, you know, I trust the Lord, right? This is where it gets really interesting. Why are we doing what we're doing? What is going on, Lord? What is this? Let's look at Haggai 2.18 and read it. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Kislev 24th, the day before Hanukkah. Oh, some of you didn't get that. The day before Hanukkah, they laid the foundation of the temple. On this date. How many of you know that a foundation being laid down is pretty important, especially the date? So on Kislev 24, in the ninth month in the Hebrew calendar, they lay the foundation for the temple in 520 B.C. How many of you understand what I'm saying? That's a date given in the Bible. So I want you to think about this. There's two parts to this day. There's two parts that are going to happen to this day. So in 520 B.C., the temple foundation is laid, and then what happens in the future? What happens later? Antiochus comes on the scene, and in the month of Kislev, in that month, at the end of the month, the 25th of Kislev, he desecrates the temple on the very date that the foundation of the temple was laid down. He does that. Offer up pigs, put it on an abomination of desolation. How many understand what I'm saying? Why would Satan pick the date of Kislev 24 to desecrate the temple? Because he's snubbing his nose at God and saying, what you, what you consecrated, I will desecrate. You laid that foundation stone, I'm going to desecrate the Temple Mount. It's desecrated right now. There's Arabs playing soccer on the Temple Mount. Desecration. There's things up there that shouldn't be up there. I'm sorry. God has allowed it. It isn't the abomination of desolation, by the way. That's coming. See, this is all leading up to the future. Why? Because we know the past. It's going to happen again. So think about it. So what happens to the Maccabees? They rise up. And he desecrates it on Kislev 24. He desecrates all this, and it goes on for like three years. And the Maccabees, what do they do? They rededicate the altar and the temple on the 25th of Kislev. It wasn't by chance. It wasn't an accident. It was because they were undoing what the enemy had done. They had fixed it, repaired it on the exact... Notice the dates are the same every time. I don't celebrate Hanukkah, you know... Hanukkah doesn't take the place of Christmas. It has nothing to do with Christmas. What I'm sharing with you has nothing to do with, ho, 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 absolutely nothing. Cutting down a perfectly good tree and putting it in your house, it has nothing to do with any of that. This is a spiritual law in spiritual warfare. So we don't have to fight pagan holidays. We just need to be obedient to what God is showing us. Do you see that? Do you get it? 
Haggai 2.19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day will I bless you because you did this. We're laying a foundation stone in here. Look at Haggai 2.20. You're going to graduate from Haggai University today. Let's read it. And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Do you see this? Wait a minute now. On Kislev 24, they laid the foundation stone for the temple. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And if we want to reflect, how many of you know in John 10, Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah? How many of you understand what I'm saying? It was, it was in the, he was pacing, he was preaching, and he says, I and the Father, when he proved his deity. How many of you understand what I'm saying? How many of you know the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24? How many of you know that Yeshua said, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath or in winter? Because the Hanukkah story is going to happen again. So if my pastor friends and Christians snub us, it's to their own demise. Because you're warning them. It has nothing to do with Christmas. You are given a warning to them that what happened in the past it's going to happen in the future. And you better learn this story. We better learn this story. So here's, the, here's, here's where we're at. Here's where we're at. He says, since you've done this, I'm going to give you a vision. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Once Hanukkah is restored like it is in here, and Hanukkah is becoming mainstream and people are gravitating to it, and they're going to understand it, the proper understanding of it all, this is what we have to look forward to now. Haggai 2.21 is a prophecy. Let's go. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Uh-oh. This is a prophecy. Once Hanukkah is restored, once it's taught and caught, something's going down, right? Look at Haggai 2.22. This is it. Let's read it. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. So we're getting all worked up over black helicopters, Mark of the Beast, and the Antichrist. God's like, don't sweat it, baby. Celebrate Hanukkah. I'll take care of everything. Because this has to go on. ISIS has to happen. The refugee crisis, all this stuff has to happen. Why? I will shake the heavens and the earth, the land and the sea. And that's what he's doing to propel us to his return. <laughs> Give this word to the doomsday preppers. <laughs> it's like this. Where's the ha oh, there's a hatch over here. The doomsday preppers. <laughs> it's it's going to be all right. <laughs> Come celebrate Hanukkah. Come on. He's going to take care of the heathen. Come on out of there. I can't believe the stories I'm hearing. You got to hunker down. You got to do this. No, you don't. You just got to be a son and daughter of God. You got you to have a right action. You got to rise up above all this garbage. I'm sick of it. Being trapped in the lies. This five-step process found in Haggai, the last page. Pull it out. And, and you know what? Let me, let me encourage all of you. I really, really appreciate your feedback. Whether it's through an email phone message, or come visit me in the office. I appreciate your input. Because you need to get this. Look at the five-step process found in Haggai. Are you ready? This is relevant for today. Number one, priorities are not in place. Go to the Lord. Pray. My wife and I, we pray. We know what's out of place. We know where we're out of line. Budget. What? We're not waiting on the Lord. Lord, give us a word. Budget. Is that a car rental place, Lord? Budget? Budget. Yeah. Okay, Lord, I hear you. I, I got a budget for the church. Yeah. The church budget is going well. The elders and the leadership and the, and the board, we, we approved of the budget. Your budget. What? Your budget. Oh, come on, God. Notice it falls on Teshuvah. How many of you know that we do Teshuvah at Beit Hila? I mean, I don't even know how many years we've been doing Teshuvah, the season of Teshuvah, but we're going to do Teshuvah again. I'm looking forward to the Daniel fast and everything again, all over again, because we've got the model. So they responded. Number two, priorities are in place. Begin to take a right action for your priorities out of place. 
This happens on a little 24, Teshiva. You're still in Teshiva. You're in the fall feast. You're heading towards them. Step number three, the future temple. How many of you know that's going to be, how many of there's a lot of controversy over the temple right now? How many of you know that there's a verse in the New Testament that talks about Satan sitting in a temple? Now, I don't know how that's all going to work out or what's going to happen. I, I don't know. All I'm saying is that there is going to be a temple from the Lord. The Lord's going to build the temple. But they could build something on there for the temporary being, prayer for all nations or I don't know, whatever they want to call it. There's all kinds of uh, 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 suggestions. So the future temple, when is that discovered? It, it's actually given on the last day of tabernacles. So what are you saying, Pastor? The more obedient you are, the more he shows you. God's no respecter of persons, everybody. I'm, oh, he's the pastor. He's got to hear from the Lord. You better hear from the Lord. Right, Barbara? You hear from the Lord, don't you? See, she does. Because you know what? He's no respecter of persons. You better hear from the Lord. Because if you're not hearing from the Lord, you're not obedient. I'm desperate for God, everybody. I'm desperate for him. I want his perfect will because I fear the Lord. I asked the Lord one time, and I said, Lord, why were you so angry with the Jewish leadership? Why were you so angry? He turned tables. He did all this crazy stuff. I mean, why were you so angry at them? And he just ministered to me. He says, because they wouldn't tell the people the truth. I said, Lord, I won't do that. I'll tell the people the truth. I'll pay the price. I'll tell the truth. I don't want you angry at me. I'll tell them the truth. I made a vow to the Lord. I made a vow to the Lord. I will always tell the truth. Now, am I perfect? No. But I will tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth. You deserve the truth. Because truth will always win out. Truth always prevails. Look at step three, the last day of tabernacles, a future temple. Is that good news? Yes. But look at number four. The foundation of the temple was laid the day before Hanukkah. You thought Hanukkah was big this year? Wait till next year. I call it Hanukkah extravaganza. We put an ad in the paper. We probably had 150 people out here watching a movie Under the Stars. We ate so much fried food that our, our doctors are mad at us. We've got cholesterol medication on the uprise. Thank you. Prophetically, think about where we're at. If this is the case, if we are the remnant and we understand Hanukkah and we're sharing it and we're moving forward, step number five is the last step. The only thing left for God to do is to judge this world. So what are you saying, Pastor? If you're obedient and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, we're not appointed to wrath or judgment. It doesn't mean you're going to have easy times. He goes, oh, I want to be Israel. Graph me in. Oh, can I share with you Jacob's trouble? Oh, no, I take it back. I'm, I don't want nothing to do with Jacob. Yeshua declared his deity on the Temple Mount on Hanukkah. John 10, 22 to 42, he declared, why would God allow his son to go down there and declare his deity? Because Antiochus claimed he was God. And that's the problem with social media and Facebook and all this stuff. We become a bunch of narcissists. We actually become little gods. Look how many followers I have. Look how popular I am. Watch my video. See my pro new profile picture. Look at me. It's very subtle, people. It's very subtle. I don't need them. They, that just disappointed me. But look what I get to do on my computer. Look at my life. You're spiritually dead because you won't join others. You're spiritually dead. And what was the prayer over the children about these branches? that are unprofitable, only good for burning up. I want our children to thrive and, and to be a part of something. But notice that this message comes the day before Hanukkah. At the same time, the temple foundation was laid. He gives a pronouncement of judgment. I gave this to my pastor friends because nobody's going to be full of excuses. I share all that I can. This Thursday, I handed this to my pastor friends. Why? Because I'm given a warning. I was told to warn you. 
I was told to warn the people. Judgment's coming. Judgment begins with the house of God. What does that mean? Because we know what is right and what is wrong. That's why God judges us first. It's nothing to be fearful of. It's just to get your house in order. Haggai. It's kind of interesting that that name actually depicts, it comes from the Hebrew root word that means a feast or a festival. Go back and study it. Hag. Haggai. Hag. Hag. What do we say? Hag Sameach. Hag. Happy festival, right? Happy festival day. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we're getting our priorities straight. We thank you, Father, that by your spirit, you will show us where we fall short. You will, you will show us, Lord, and, and we, just, um, we just bow down before you. We humbly come before you, Father, and we know that we have a habit of looking at others and being judgmental, and we ask you to forgive us for that, Father. We pray that we would get our house in order because we don't want our house to be desolate. Father, I thank you for providing for this storehouse. I thank you for all that you've done for every person in this place. Father, we thank you that you will use us to minister to the church and to this community the good news of the gospel, both Old and New Testaments, Father, because that's what it means, good news. And there's good news in the Old Testament. We know that Yeshua is in there, and then he's revealed in the New Testament. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. I just pray that you take us to the next level, that you break off these bondages, Father, these curses, these things that hold us back, Father. And, and we just pray, Father, the potential that's inside of us will grow and it will come out of us, Father. And we will be the sons and daughters you created us to be, Father. You created us to be full of joy and peace and to be prosperous and to, to be helpful to others. And I pray, Father, that you would put that love in us because you are, you are love. It's not something you muster up. You are the God of love. You are love. You are the epitome of love. And so we thank you for loving this house. Father, I just lift up this holiday season to you. I pray that we'd be a witness. Relationships would be restored, Father. Families would be restored. Marriages would be restored. Children would come home. And Father, uh, we just pray for this. And uh, we just thank you for this Shabbat. We thank you for the cool weather. We just lift up those that are going camping. And uh, we just bless them, Father. And uh, we just thank you for making this community stronger and stronger. Because the enemy cannot devour us. We submit ourselves to you. We resist the devil. He will flee from us. You are in control, Father. So we just pray for our obedience and everything else will add up. We ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you. You're a beautiful people, I tell you.